I want to thank Maya and Terry, first of all, for inviting me because what they've done for you is to put their hearts and souls into something that is, uh, the intention is to enhance your lives. And that's really what motivates me and what motivates our company. And there are several representatives here tonight. So um, I hope you'll get a chance to talk to them. Uh, they all buy into this vision. It's about women. That isn't to say that we don't care about the men <laughs> and, and the children. But our, our vision is to contribute to women's lives, to empower them, to make them feel confident so that they can do their jobs better. Uh, we recently did some focus groups with women about makeup because makeup seems kind of trivial, doesn't it? Sort of, you know, one of those things that your mom would wish you didn't wear. <laughs> Uh, but what we found out was that it was really very far from trivial, that women talked about what it did for their self-esteem, that they felt better able to do their jobs, their confidence level rose. They, were, they, they, they faced the day in a with a different attitude, that it was very, very important to them those quiet moments that they could spend on themselves for a change. And you all know what that means, how hard it is to find time just for you, that it actually helped them to sit down, focus, even if it was just five minutes, 10 minutes, on making themselves feel better. And then they carried that out in the world. This was a big lesson to us and actually improved the way we felt about ourselves too, knowing that it really was happening in a concrete way in all areas of the country. And uh, we distributed now in almost 50 countries. So we were reaching people, women behind veils, and it was making a difference in their lives too. So I actually want to tell you that um, that I feel a bit of a fraud standing here. And I mean that sincerely because phrases like risk and return, T-bills, government bonds, investment grade corporate bonds, preferred stock, options, futures, commodities, derivatives, send me into a coma. <laughs> because I always assumed I wouldn't have any, so why bother to find out what they are? <laughs> and that's the way I live now. And that's why I have people like Terry to help explain these to me. It goes in one ear and out the other. So uh, if you're expecting to ask me questions about any of those uh, things, um, <laughs> don't even bother. <laughs> Because I'm convinced that at the end of this series, you will know much more about them than I do. I will be happy to answer questions when I've got through my meager presentation. And I'll answer them as honestly as I can. So I think, actually, I've been asked to speak tonight more to talk to you about what it takes to be an entrepreneur uh, what it takes, and, I, and I, th I see that as something that's not just a, uh, you know, a company with employees, but being a one-man shop. Everything from that to, um, to, we now have 170 people working for us. We started out with me, you know, in, a, in, in one room, and it grew, it's grown over uh, 18 years to be something that I never conceived. And Terry talks about goals, but the truth is I really didn't have any goals. Um, the, my goal was to pay the bills. And I think that's perfectly okay if that's what, you, that's what you want to do. If your goal is to make enough money to pay the bills, that's a very honorable quest, and, and I support you in that. I've never taken a course in business. I actually didn't know what an MBA was when I first came here. I ended up going to college at NYU, 
and I, my uh, BA was in English, and then I got an MA in English and philosophy. So um, there's nothing, nothing in there um, that it remotely prepared me for running a business. But I do know three, what I think of as three golden rules. The first of that is do what you say you're going to do. I think if we could all live by that maxim, I didn't make that up, by the way. I heard that somebody else said that, and I thought, oh, that sounds really good. <laughs> do what you say you're going to do. That way builds trust, credibility, dependability, all of those things that are key to, to life in general and to running a business. Second would be surround yourself with good people. You know that, that saying what A people hire A people and B people hire C people? I remind myself of that all the time when we're looking at uh, hiring somebody for a job. Uh, the other thing that we use is uh, 2 plus 2, does it equal 4? Or does it equal five? If we're interviewing somebody and we think two plus two equals five, we know, we know that she's going to get a lot of consideration. And the third one is pay your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I say that? Well, I'm going to get a little bit into some of the history of the, the three companies that I've started and two of which are no longer in existence. But I've been there. I know what it's like when you owe taxes. And I know how it isn't just about the penalties and the interest that just rack up like, you know, like a mafia <laughs> conversation. Um, it's, it's how debilitating it is, how it robs you of your energy and your, your, your sense of drive. It's... Uh, it's a miserable thing to go through. So whatever it takes, just stay current. And then ask yourself these questions. If you're really thinking about starting your own business, whether it's just for, for your, by yourself or whether you actually have some money that you can em employ some people, ask yourself these questions. Am I prepared to work hard? And when I think I've worked as hard as I can, am I prepared to work harder? Do I have the stomach for the sacrifices that it's going to take to be a success? And then de define what you mean by success. For me at the time, it was, I want to pay my mortgage. My goal, my, my reason for being was, and always has been, was to enhance the lives of women. But I didn't quite know how I was going to do that. And I didn't know that it was going to mean anything financially. But I worked because I wanted to pay the bills. And then I would suggest that you look back on your life and you see if being your own boss has really been your propensity. And what I mean by that is that when I look back, to, through, right back to childhood, I see that I always had a take charge personality. My mother would call it bossy. <laughs> we lived in an area that was very, was a built up area, but at the time there was, there was very little traffic and we used to, kids, we used to play in the street all the time. And we had a kind of version of uh, baseball where you could round us. And I was, I was the one that was, was organizing the game. I would come in at night, my mum would say, I only hear one voice out there and it's yours. <laughs> but I was always the organizer, I was always the decider. It just came naturally. That didn't mean that I, I was right even half the time. But making decisions never frightened me. And I, th I think that's an important thing for you to look at. Do you waffle on decisions? Because if you do, it's better for it to work for somebody else. <coughs> I 
there's a very overused word, uh, but I'm going to use it anyway because I don't know a better one to describe what I mean, which is the word passion. If you don't feel passionate about what you're doing, what you want to do, then find something that you feel passionate about. Because believe me, it's the passion that's going to take you through all of this, through this hard work, through the, through the sleepless nights. Let me give you an example. When I was starting the company, this company, it required travel even in the beginning. And, but I was on my own. So what did I, I, the only way I could do it to travel was to finish up everything that I could finish up before I left, and which required staying up all night on many, many occasions. And most of it was about paying the bills, paying the taxes, so I could leave feeling clean about where I was going. That's the kind of thing that you're going to be required to do. And if you don't have the passion to carry you through it, you're not going to make it. So I want to take you back to my first company, which um, Terry briefly mentioned. It was called Castaway. And I think that it shows my, my sort of typic, the typical entrepreneurial um, way of dealing with life. I was a casting director at J. Walter Thompson. We had a lovely department and everything was going very well. We had huge accounts and um, I was actually putting a little bit of savings away for the first time in my life when uh, Thompson decided to disband its casting department and to go with freelance people. So instead of thinking, oh, well, I've got this experience now in one of the major com like, advertising agencies in the world, I can certainly find a job in another advertising agency as a casting director, my immediate thought was, oh, I'll go out and do it on my own. I'll be one of those freelance people that they're looking for, that they're going to be using. So it, it's... The, it, that's what I, there was those milestones when I look back and say, how did, what, how did this happen? Well, it was decisions like that that made this happen. So I formed this little uh, company with an, another, um, with a friend. We cast uh, commercials and films. But one of the things I learned, um, and it was a lot of fun, one of the things I learned was that we were a service agency. In other words, we had to put time in against every penny we made. And there's only a fa finite amount of time. You know, even if you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you re you're up against this thing because we got paid for the amount of time we put in against something. And it didn't seem to me that I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing that. It, um, being in service is... Uh, is a problem, especially if you have spaces in between jobs. <laughs> so together with that, I filmed, uh, formed a film company. Um, and I know that sounds very grand, you know, well, that's David Spielberg stuff. No, it wasn't. It was one room in Manhattan, and we, uh, we got grants to make films for PBS, and some of them actually did go on to HBO. So I had a product. Finally, you know, we put in a lot of time and effort against these films, but in the end, we actually had something tangible. But there wasn't a, a tremendous amount of um, stuff we could do with films in cans. Um, so we've, we switched, we didn't switch deliberately, but it sort of happened that the next thing we did was theatre. And then we really knew what it was like to fail. <laughs> we had a, uh, did a Broadway musical that was a big success in uh, Washington, D.C., and moved to Broadway where it flopped in a week. And so there was absolutely, at the end of that, nothing to show for the money, the time, the effort, the anything, and we were just flat out. Then I thought, well... I'll write screenplays because I've been doing a lot of writing during this time. And sure enough, the first screenplay I write was optioned. Whoa, here comes the big time now. Getting something optioned is not like having it produced. And even having it produced isn't like having it shown in the cinemas. It's a long road. Um, and of course, it didn't happen. So... I was tired of having a product nobody wanted. 
and I thought, I'm going to tax my brain. I do believe there's a creative process that takes place in the brain, and it's now more and more studies are being done to show that this is really true, that if you set the brain a problem and you sleep on it, it figures it out for you. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it, really does. it really works. So this night I went to bed and I thought, I'm going to find, think of something that's wanted and needed. So that was my mantra. What's wanted and needed? What's wanted and needed? What's wanted and needed? Fell asleep saying that. Three o'clock in the morning, woke up, thought, what about a makeup that's good for the skin? <laughs> I was staying with a friend in London. And she, the, the night that I, the, that night she'd said to me, you know, when I come back to the Berkshires, you need to think of something I can be involved in that's going to keep me, keep me in the style to which I've become accustomed. <laughs> so, you know, I, I like a challenge. So I went down that next morning and I said, so how about a makeup that's good for the skin? And I told her, I figured it all out. You know, what I was going to, how I was going to market it, how I was going to do it. I didn't know a thing about cosmetics. She, gave, she wrote me a check for $5,000 and said, I'm your first investor. So that was the amount of money that I started with. That, and I maxed out my credit cards. That's, by the way, how a lot of women start their businesses, M much more so than men who are more canny about debt, I guess. I don't know, Terry would be able to answer that one. <laughs> we look at our credit cards and think, ooh, I've got 2,000 left on this one. I think I'll buy my stationery with it. <laughs> that what, what's wanted and needed is a very interesting phrase because I'm sure that, you know, didn't Ben Franklin say a, a better mousetrap? Um, if there's... If what's wanted and needed is a better mousetrap, there's going to be a market for it. So now I was in a completely product-driven business. Started out with one product, which was, some of you may be wearing it tonight, our loose mineral powders. Are you wearing it, Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> and that started in, in uh, 1994. I had... Honestly, I, I, I crossed my heart. I had no idea this was going to develop into a full line of makeup that was going to be sold into salons and spas and medical offices and throughout the country. I, I, it didn't occur to me. What was driving me was that I wanted to do something that would help women's skins, that would enhance their lives. Because I'd seen this happen in show business about how hard it was to keep a healthy skin. There's so much going on. So many different makeups being, being thrown on and people breaking out. And, and in those days, it was before Photoshop. So it was um, airbrushing was a very expensive technique. Nobody wanted to do it. It's interesting how you file things away when, you're, when, it, it, when you look back and you think how things were little instances that sort of build and build and build that they actually prepare you for something. They look as if they're inconsequential at the time, but they're, they're all building up in your brain. And I remember this time going to a casting session at Eileen Ford's, and she said to me, I would never hire a model with bad skin. And why would I remember that, that little phrase um, when you know, we're bombarded with so much stuff all, all the time? Why would I remember that? Well, it kind of kept coming back into my head as, wow, that's a big deal. That means if somebody has a pimple, they don't get a job? Um, and so I think that that's, that's that sort of built, started to build the passion, which is still, as you could probably tell, very much with me today. I wanted to just give you one other, um, one other tip that I, that I lived by when I, was, uh, when I was the bookkeeper at the company. And I've passed this um, advice on to our uh, bookkeepers now, which is, Find out which of your vendors report you to Dun & Bradstreet if you're late paying your bills. Because you're going to do a lot of juggling with finances, especially in the beginning. Now, I've got this much, but I owe this much. So who gets it? What you're going to need is a clean credit, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, profile when you start to get bigger because you're going to need to borrow money. You're going to need an American Express card. And, 
And the only way you're going to get that is if you've been careful about your Dun & Bradstreet. So when people look you up, you look like a good risk. It's just another a tip. Uh, it's easy to find out. I can tell you right now some of them. <laughs> the messenger services all report you if you're late. <laughs> your bank's going to report you if you're late with your mortgage. There are some key things. You've got, certainly your credit cards will report you. So just make sure that you stay um, on top of that. I don't know how much more that you want to hear about my story. Um, I'm sure you've got tons of questions. So if you, you ra rather we get, go to Q&A than me keep rabbiting away, um, I'm happy to do that. And perhaps I can talk about how the company evolved uh, during the question and answer period. Does that sound, some of you nodding, does that sound good? OK. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, Jane, I'm wondering, uh, since you have had so many different experiences in your um, trial and error process of starting companies and going through that horrible experience of failure, um, when you were looking at basically packing up again and saying, OK, so now I'm going to start a cosmetics company, what um, did you have doubts and fears, and how did you overcome them if you did? Well, I, I never actually thought, oh, now I'm going to start a cosmetics company. I think that would have been complete insanity. And I do border on being insane, but not <laughs> quite that insane. I mean, if I, if I thought I'm going to start a cosmetic company, I probably would have scared myself to death really fast by doing a business plan, which I've never done. And... And then I would have realized that there were all these huge companies out there that were going to swallow me up. So as somebody just described them, there were these big icebergs floating around and we're little, little chips of sort of you know, swimming around them. Um, but I said, but we've got hammers. We're hacking away at those icebergs. Um, <laughs> what I thought was, oh, I have a product, one product that I know there's a market for that I know I can share with people who need something that's good for their skin. And then the question was, well, where do I sell it? Because having a product is one thing, but finding a market is another. And that took time. I looked at multi-level. By the way, if I could just do a little non sequitur here and tell you that I've, I've never thought of myself as being a sales person. I've never been in sales, except I had a Saturday job when I was... 14, selling toys at our local department store at Christmas. But apart from that, I didn't think sales was even in my lexicon. But some funny things happened. When I was making this transition and I needed to pay the bills, I started to get in, uh, I, I found this product called Super Blue Green Algae. Does anybody know it? And I loved it because it fit right in with my thought feelings about nutrition and how it would help people. And, and so what I found was that I went through the ladder, you know those ladders they have, and then you go, you know, I went through the ladder so fast, it was, was, I was smoking <laughs> because I was so passionate about this product. And uh, we had these meetings and uh, people would say, but you've signed up 40 people this week. How, how did you do that? I said, well, you know, I just do my thing. And they said, well, what is your thing? And I said, well, I just tell them about it. I, because I, my belief was so strong. So, I, and I, so when, I came, when I had this product that I, that I, that I loved and I, and I thought would help, and I, I, it was the same thing. I couldn't help but have this enthusiasm. And, and having had that experience with the blue-green algae, I realized I could do it. So it never occurred to me that I was going to fail because I believed in it so much. And some, I really feel it's something that, you, that if you don't have that, it's going to be really hard work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, you, were, you had it. Yes. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, when you mentioned that you came up with $5,000 and then your credit cards, you said you would create this product. How did you come up with the idea yeah. of the product? Right. 
Well, I didn't really know what the product would look like then. I, but it, that, it took a while to call around. I, I called some hairdressers I knew that, I, that would, had their own makeup. You know, where, did they, where did they get it made? And, and then eventually I found a chemist in a uh, woman, as a matter of fact. So that's interesting too, because the men, the male chemists I was talking to were telling me, you know, we've always done it this way. That's the way we're going to keep doing it. What you're talking about can't be done. <laughs> and so and I remember going to a trade show when I was about a, a year into it and sales were picking up and he, we talked about the formula and he said, oh, that can't be done. And I knew I was doing it. So I, I said, well, but then I started to, to challenge him on that. And I thought, no, don't be stupid, because if you convince him that it can be done, then he's going to take it and sell it to everybody else. <laughs> so you know, I was learned. I was learning. I didn't realize how competitive this business is. But um, uh, so, yeah, so that was it. I found a, a female chemist, and together we worked on what we thought would be a formula that would accomplish what? we were looking for, which was, you know, to get down to the nitty gritty of it, we wanted something that would let the skin breathe, we wanted something that would stay on, we wanted it to give some protection, we didn't want any nasties in it, we didn't want anything that we would lose sleep over, um, the people wearing on their skins, which by the way is our body's largest organ, it's our body's third lung, our body's third kidney, what we put on it really matters to our inner health. So that was important to us. That actually was going to be my question, how you developed the product, but then what was your first step, just to sell it, or did you, was your first step, I've heard some entrepreneurs say the first thing they like to do is to print stationery, and it doesn't hurt. <laughs> 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 um, so how did you motivate yourself then to take business steps? Um, as I look back on, on, the, on the trail, there's, there are things that stand out as beacons and the kind of when I did my stationery, I have you know, no idea when that happened. I, I probably, oh, I think I, what I did was I just did something on, on one word and ran it off. I don't think it was anything very fancy. But I was so, because I was so product driven. So I looked at all these different places about where to set health food stores, decided that wasn't it because product needed some education and there was never anybody around in a health food store as much as I love them and haunt them. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't the right place. So I, I've, I called two friends uh, who I thought might have some insights for me. And one of them knew a spa, a makeup artist in a spa in California. And she said, send her some samples. So I did. You know, always do what you say you're going to do. So I sent her the samples. The next thing I know, I get a call from her saying, this stuff is fantastic. I've got women lined up outside my door for this. Send me some more. Send her some more. I, I was mixing it up in a stainless steel bowl and a kitchen whip. <laughs> and I used to go to Miller's Art Store in Pittsfield and buy the art, artist's uh, uh, wooden palettes. And, take, and, I, and I'm a hopeless artist, but I... I bought some gold paint with a brush and I wrote, because the company at that time was called Innovation, and I, would, and I wrote Innovation and I bought some Velcro from the dress shop in, uh, Pitts, in uh, Great Barrington, stuck it on the bottom of these little pots and stuck them on these pallets. Some people still have those pallets to this day. Uh, anyway, so it, it, one of her clients was the wife of a plastic surgeon. And she called me and said, you know, this product really answers the problem my husband's having right now with laser resurfacing, which was where the skin is ablated and then it, then it removes things like scarring and hopefully wrinkles and so on. And, but it leaves the skin very red for a long time. And so women were shying away from having it done because it meant they couldn't get back to work, they were scaring their kids, you know, it was just... <laughs> Uh, so she said, but this, this covers it, and it's good for the skin, it's giving some protection. So would you come out to this little trade show and talk about it? So I did, of course. Now, I mean, the stories go on and on, but um, 
I had no money to get to California. So I found this friend of mine introduced me to this great guy who's not with us anymore, but he was in a bank, local bank. And I went in to him and I said, I need a loan. And he said, well, let me look at your receivables. What are receivables? <laughs> well, let me look at the money people owe you. Well, I've got, so I think I had something like $1,200. And he looks at it and he says, Jane, you've really got to get up your receivables. <laughs> okay, well, I'll do it if you tell me how. But he, I don't know what it was. He suddenly, he just had this belief in me, which is very rare. I don't think it would happen today. And he wrote me, he, he made me a loan for $10,000. And I just threw it in the bank. I took the money out and I ran to the airport. And I got to California, to this little Seattle, actually, to this little show where there was a plastic surgeon. I know this story is going on along, but I think it's illustrative in that it shows you how little things make such a huge difference. Uh, so I, I went to hear this plastic surgeon speak about laser resurfacing, and he was, he was really bemoaning the fact that women weren't having this great procedure because they, they, left, they were left so red. So when he came out of the room, I grabbed him and I said, I think I've got something that can help. And I, you know, all doctors have red knuckles. Did you know that? Because they're washing their hands so much, they're always red. So my trick is to get a sponge with, a, with some of the minerals on it and put it on their red knuckles so they could see that the red disappeared. And they'd go, oh, wow. And he did the same thing. He said, come to my clinic and do a demonstration, which happened to be the Leahy Clinic in Boston. So I didn't need any money for a plane. And they still carry our product to this day. The first day, they used to put, keep it in a little drawer with his secretary. Somebody would walk out and she'd sort of pull the drawer out. Now they've got this huge aesthetic center because it's all, you know, it's, it's become not just our makeup, but skincare and everything has become such a huge part of what they do. So, so it was that little break that I had of send these samples to this woman. Yes, I'll do that. And I did it. Just carried through the chain. And there it was. You didn't mention having any background in chemistry or anything like that, but you did mention being in the kitchen and in a stainless steel bowl. So how did you go from having a chemist friend of yours help you with coming up with a recipe to making it in your kitchen to packaging it and selling it? I'm not sure I completely understand what, what you're asking me. Uh, let me see if I can answer that. Um, and tell me if I don't. Our first product is a loose powder. It had four ingredients in it. And so the question was the proportions of the ingredients, uh, the different shades. I think we started out with something like eight base shades, maybe six. So it was a question of mixing them to the right shades and making sure that they were consistent. And I used to dip my finger in and go like that on my wrist to check it to my control color. Still, we still do that, by the way. Even the big companies still do that. Um, and, and filling the little jars. Well, then demand gets heavier. And, and then you outgrow the stainless steel bowl on the kitchen whip. So you, you have to find a, a factory or a lab that will adhere to your formula and do the packaging for you. Did that answer that? Yeah. How, do you, how did you determine pricing? Because many people who are entrepreneurs have mm -hmm. to figure out, well, how much to price your product in a way that it will generate an income. Yeah, that, that's a really good question, and it's something we still debate today because there are different, you have different uh, motivations with different products. So if you, if it, we call our core products where we need to uh, make money on them to pay the bills. Well, you, you, have to, you have to be very careful with that. So what does the fill cost you? What does the packaging cost you? And it's easy to leave something out because if you take, say, our little loose powder in its box, 
that's, you think, oh, that's just two products. But actually, it isn't. It's about seven. Because you've got the jar, you have the sifter, you have the label that goes on the sifter, you have the sponge that goes in the sifter, you have the lid that goes on the jar, you have the box itself, then you have the barcode, then you have the label. And if you forget one of those things, then all your pricing is thrown off and you end up not making, not covering your costs. So have to be really careful about how you break that down. And then we have a formula uh, that we need. Uh, I'm, not, and I'm not even sure what it is, but it's so five, five times cost to uh, pay for the marketing, the merchandising, the displays, the 401ks, or whatever it is. Now, there are products that we do that are just for promotion, things that we feel we'll take a loss on, or at least just cover our costs uh, without making any profit, because it, we feel it's something that we want to get in some people's hands. And we do that a lot with samples. So we cover our cost on them, but because we feel, I feel, that if we can get it on somebody's skin, then it's a sale. I just want them to try it. So if, if you're new at that, then it's, go it's good to get some help with establishing those costs, because it is tricky. Uh, <coughs> there's so much more consciousness now about uh, how workers are treated. Uh, when you get your minerals, uh, finding out how those workers are treated that mine those minerals. Uh, I think with, you know, Apple is such a great product, but when we found out that, that uh, you know, that the Chinese workers there were being were being, uh, you know, paid abysmally. <coughs> how do you, how do you, how are your values about the environment, workers' wages, mm. a sustainable economy, a consciousness about how your values reflect, mm. you know, uh, you, the whole business connections, all the business yeah. connections you make? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a difficult one to answer because it, there are so many things that, that make up the whole that you can really only be as conscious as it's possible to be. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have some very, uh, very nice cosmetic brushes. They're made in China. Most brushes are. They're made from natural hair. And there are animals involved. There are ponies, goats, and so on. It, this bothered me a lot because, well, how are they treated? Um, are they killed to make my brushes, and so on? So you can dig as deep as you can. In our case, uh, I don't know if any of you have been to China, but nothing's wasted in China. So no animals ever killed to make brushes. That I, that I can assure you. Except I was concerned about sable, because I didn't see anybody eating sable. So, and I couldn't get a straight answer on it, so we dropped sable brushes from the line. You know, I felt that was something that I could actively do. Can I tell you that the workers who mine titanium dioxide, or they don't actually mine titanium dioxide, they, they mine the rutile that is, forms the basis of titanium dioxide. Can I tell you that they're getting fair wages and they're not? I, I can't. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to find that out. I do know that we work with reputable labs, uh, suppliers, who I've visited, who I feel are uh, the best that I can uh, find in the United States, and they, and I have to. There has to be a level of trust. So that's just, that's it. I mean, we belong to Peter. We um, we we try as hard as we can, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's also the the same thing when it comes to ingredients. People will say. How can you have this ingredient in your product? And I say, well, if you can find me something that can substitute for it, I'd be happy to do it. But I have to make it from something. Because if I took out everything that people have a problem with, we wouldn't have, a, we wouldn't have any. There would be no skincare. There would be no makeup. There'd be no shampoos. There'd be no anything. Because there's something wrong with everything if you take it down to those those levels, and now there are bills going through Congress that want us to analyze ingredients down to parts per billion. And if we were to do that, uh, well, first of all, we'd have ingredient lists six pages long, and it would, it would hurt the natural products 
more than the synthetic products because the natural ingredient is so much more complex than the synthetic ingredient, which is very simple. So if you take a leaf and you analyze that down to parts per billion, you would find lead, you would find arsenic, you would find all of those, you know, what are now those heavy metal buzzwords um, because they're ubiquitous. They were part of the planet when it began. They're everywhere. Uh, so there has to be a level of sort of, you know, a sensible yeah, level of, yeah. of the, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Jane. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a financial uh, question, and maybe you can help me. Um, what is the best um, the hardest part about, for me, myself, I've been in my business now, my own business, for 14 years up here, almost as long as mm. your, I have your product since you came into the production, thanks to Jamie. <laughs> uh, and so I now have my business in Great Barrington. The hardest part for me in the business end, not my service part, because I can do all that, is when you sell product, whether it's my skincare product or your product, and the money comes in, and I have a good retail bed, I don't take that money at all. I gotta pay Jane, I gotta pay the soap company, I gotta pay them, because I have to pay the sales tax first and so on. And so the hardest part for me in my business, since it's so small and I do everything myself, is how do you prioritize, like, how that, because I'm sure you have the same thing, you're waiting for money from us to, and all your us's, to pay. How do you figure who, I mean, I know my rent has to be paid. I know the oil, ours are not going to give us the oil for the, to keep warm in So, But the hardest part is the prioritizing in the month to, for the finances. How do you keep that without going into debt and keep taking a loan and Well, I don't know that I'm going to be able to give you any, uh, any revelatory insight in, in, in that. But uh, I don't make many lists, but probably I would make a list. Mm -hmm. and, I would write, and I would do it from high priority to low priority, and I'd look at everything as, as a need. Do I, 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 do I need electric light? Yes, that's got to go you know, on the top of the list. Do, do I need... Can I, can I uh, push my rent off for a couple of months? Probably could if you spoke to your landlord. I mean, I, what I've found, especially in the early days, is that if you communicate with people, then you, you, you'll be amazed at what they will live with. It's the non-communication that kills you. When they don't hear from you, I think people feel that if they ignore it for a while that it'll just go away or at least but it doesn't and it just festers so it's much better to be clear and say what's going on no i i've got to pay my phone bill and my electric light i'm going to pay you know that i've been in the building for how many years but could you live with it if i uh, if i push it off for a month or you know how you put it it's it's a uh, it's worth a try. And so I think you've, you've got to, you know, you know, do you need to pay us because otherwise you won't get more product? Well, you do, but is that essential to keeping your business open? It is actually isn't, is it? It, it is not because not, it, we're not going to close you down. You just won't have amazing base to sell. But not paying your electric bill will close you down. So I think... I think you've got to look yeah, at it like that. I think that in this uh, time of the economy, the things have changed. That that is the part. I mean, I've been managing. I do it on a small, very small level. But it seems to be the hardest part for me. The, the business end. Of it, the business. No, it's the hardest part for all of us. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> Thank you. So how? Um, you started something new, but now there's many competitors, right? You can buy mineral makeup at Costco <coughs> and so on. So how do you continue to compete once others have come in and done things, you know, in as low cost a way as possible and so on? How, at that point, do you, do you continue to be in the forefront? 
I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but I don't think of it them as being competitors. <laughs> I, I, I look ahead. I look at where it is I want us to go, what I want us to do. I have such faith and confidence in our products. I know, I know we're the best on the market. It's just, it's that simple. So I'm not looking behind me. I mean, I want to be aware of who's out there. That would be stupid not, not to do that. But I don't ever want it to affect me so that I'm thinking, oh, I've got to be careful because they're doing that over there or that over there, or maybe we should make that product because they've just made that product. I know a lot of people copy us, and, and I know they won't do it as well. So I just move on and let the devil take the hindmost is my, my <laughs> philosophy. Yeah. I was wondering how, if, or if the recession has affected your products, and also it has a second kind of what goals have you set for yourself now? Um, yes, yeah, yes, I will. Yeah. Well, has the recession affected us, and uh, what goals have we set for ourselves now? Is that right? Yes, the recession has affected us. We were uh, in triple-digit growth for many years. Well, for several years, and then double-digit growth. And then I, when we went to, from triple to double, I said, what's going on? What's wrong? Jane, you can't grow at triple digits every year. It's like, you know, that game where you take one thing and you double it, and you double it, and you finally got this enormous pile. Um, and then, and so we, but we were still you know, doing nicely, and then the recession hit, and we went flat almost overnight. So I coined the phrase of flat is the new up. <laughs> because, because, you know, most of I was hearing most people complaining about going down, and I thought we were doing well to, to stay flat. Um, and it's never really uh, gone back to the way it was before that hit. I mean, it was, we're growing, but at a slower rate. And I, and I frankly am not too optimistic about uh, the next five years. I think what's going on in Europe is going to have a huge effect on everybody. I don't know how Terry feels about this, but he's the, he's the eternal optimist. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not so optimistic. Um, goals. Well, we just, we just launched a new line. Um, this is a, you know, one of those opportunities, and you can imagine now that you know a little bit more about me how this happened. We have a distributor in Norway who's been doing very well. And uh, she uh, came to us one day and she said, we have this chain of pharmacies, uh, 200 pharmacies that would like to carry your line, although it's a bit expensive for them. And I said, well, we're not going to go into pharmacies, but I'll make them a line. <laughs> that was in August. And uh, Jamie and Ellen and Courtney know that um, what that I put everybody through to make that happen because they needed to launch on May the 1st and we went uh, the actual launch time was mid-April now it probably doesn't mean much to you because it's hard for you to get your arms around how what that means but it from design to formulas 80 SKUs 80 stock keeping units with all of the ancillary materials, the marketing, the merchandising, the displays, we, the company was just turned on its head. But we did it. And it was a very successful launch. And now we're rocking and rolling in Norway, and we're thinking that that line will be, will be able to, roll, to move that into other countries. It's a, it's a cheaper line, it's a smaller line. Formulas are very similar, but... So that may be our that may be our recession hedge. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, firstly, I just want to say how refreshing it is hearing you speak about your journey as a businesswoman. It's that um, feminine way of approaching things. There's such a humility to how you started. It reminds me of Anita Roddick, yeah. who started. Yeah, that happened very near where I used to live in England, by the way. The first one in Cambridge. Yeah. Um, so there's something really wonderful, I think, for all of us as women, and as business women, as potentially entrepreneurs, um, to hear that because there's a soberness about it. 
It's not yeah. that intoxicated idea that you start up one morning, you have this fantastic dream and you're going to go for it. So I really honor and thank you for that sense of humility that it has taken you to be an incredibly successful woman. But I'd like to ask you about failure. Because I think what stops women from really stepping fully into their power, into their vision, their dreams, is this fear that failure is going to step up, as it will, and not knowing how to handle it and deal with it. So can you give us some insights into how you have met your failures and moved through them? Well, I, yes, I can. I'll try to do it without um, crying. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people, the fear of failure is huge, of course, but there are a lot of people who are paralyzed by fear of success. Did you know that? You know, how you deal with that. Um, yeah, I think that my biggest failure, but I don't look back on my, my two other two companies as failures. They, they were just things I moved away from. You know, I never made a lot of money from them, but they never went bankrupt. I just moved to something else. The thing that was the biggest failure was the Broadway show. And if there's nothing more humiliating than being humiliated in public. And when you've got uh, the New York Times, the Daily News, the Post, the television, telling everybody what a terrible show it was. Uh, by the way, I was nominated for a Tony for that show, so there's a, there's a very strange thing going on there. Um, and that's another story. It's really funny. When we, we went to so the Tony, is, um, and I knew I wasn't going to win, but of course, who could resist going? I had nothing to wear. <laughs> um, except this old red long, red long dress that I dug out of a closet somewhere. And I don't know what was possessed me, but I thought, oh, I put it on a gold belt, and I looked like a Christmas tree. <laughs> and I remember sitting in the audience. So here's the fear of success bit coming up. I remember sitting in the audience and everybody was there, you know, Sarah Jessica Parker with their little cute things and everybody was there. And I was sitting thinking, please don't let me win. Please don't let me win. <laughs> if I have to go up on stage in this dress, I'm going to die. I'm just going to die. So there was a fear of success right there. Um, th that failure um, it was huge. And I remember falling into my dad's arms and just sobbing. And I had, he was not that, the kind of man that did that very often. But I, I, it was as hard on them as it was on me. It was a, a terrible, terrible time. It, because I felt I'd let so many people down, not just myself, but all the people who put money in the show and the, the cast and all the, the technicians. Because putting something on like that requires so much effort from so many people. And they have to believe in it and come together and over weeks and weeks and weeks of grueling rehearsals and so on. And then for it all to just be dashed inside of a week, it's hard to take. So it, was, it wasn't something that I got over very quickly. I do, what helped a lot was I went to a talk by Carol Hyatt, I'm sure a lot of you know her, at the Spencertown Academy, because I was living in Austerlitz at the time. And she'd just written a book called Why Smart People Fail. And I listened to her talk and didn't know her at the time, and I went up and told her that, uh, about you know, my, my tragedy. And uh, that whole encounter really helped me to see that I was I was going to learn a lot from it eventually, once I got through the grieving process. And you know, it t says, what well, they say, grief, that whole grief, sadness part takes a good year, and it certainly did, uh, to get back on the horse and start riding again and doing something else. And that, she, that, that then followed 10 years of the Mark Twain uh, show, um, which I wrote and produced in Elmira, New York. Um, so did, did that answer? It's, it's, it, I think when you're going through that kind of, uh, you need to reach out to, and I, I, that's an expression, by the way, that I really hate that's coming to the language. Instead of we don't talk to people anymore, we reach out to them. We don't call them, we reach out. We don't email them, we reach out. Um, so when you want to say reach out, it doesn't have a meaning anymore. But I did reach out that, during those times to everything that I could to find that could help. Um, and, and you find out, too, 
really who I remember that I thought I had some a couple of very good friends in in the show business. We used to do a lot of uh, you know, dinners together and shows together and so on. I didn't hear from them for a long time afterwards, and then they later told me that they really cut ties with me because they were afraid the failure was catching. <laughs> but I think that that I think. You know, I look back at it now, do I, would I want to relive that? Absolutely not. But am I glad it happened? No. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if it had been a success, I wouldn't have started my company. So, right. you know. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit on, and I think it's unique to women in business, because there's this maternal aspect to starting something. And then you get to a point where it's not just you anymore and you've got to trust other people and, and give off responsibilities. How does that, there's a shift that happens. How do you, do you have any tips? How do you on, delegate? Is that what you're asking? Uh, not even the physical delegation, but how do you process it yourself? Like, this is my baby and now I'm handing pieces of it off. Like, how, what was that process like internally? Well, it, it's a really good question because it's something that you all have, you all have to face. I mean, whether you have a company or not, you know, you face it with your families, with your children. You know, there's a point where you have to say, they can do that. I'm going to have to let them do that themselves. Right, Jamie? Uh, and it's, 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 it's hard. I think that what, I, what I've done is um, it's easy to hand off those things that you don't enjoy very much. So, you know, I don't like budget meetings, and if I can have somebody else do that for me, I'm really happy. Um, bookkeeping, you know, all of the, and the stuff that I didn't feel that I'm very good at. IT, for example. All right, I mean, don't even get me started. It's another language. You can't even go in the you can't even go in there enclave, and and without coming up feeling like a fool. It's just. Uh, it's a whole other world. So what I've tried to do is hang on to those things that are really meaningful to me. So that, I mean, it doesn't mean that I don't go to a lot of meetings and sit in and pretend I understand what they're talking about. But, <laughs> um, but things like the, the creation of the products, that's my, that's my thing. And I'm not going to give that up, no matter what happens. Um, I get, I'm very involved in marketing um, and uh, and. Our, the merchandising aspects of it. Very involved with uh, what's going on in the field. We've got 70 people in the field who are educators and salespeople and uh, regional directors. And so I've 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 made a mental list of those things that I I'm going to hang on to. But it is hard. It it, it is hard giving up. Uh, I mean, it's, I used to do all the marketing, so. We now have a big marketing department, um, but I'm still very involved in it. But sometimes I walk in and I see something that was done that I didn't have anything to do with, and I think, how did that happen? And then I have to say to myself, that's what you're paying them for. <laughs> it's the best answer I can give on that one. Sorry. Yeah. I have a question about something you said when you were giving your talk about assessing what kind of person you are and whether you're the type of person who likes to make decisions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that threw me off a little bit because I, it just seems like women in general are not people who tend to want to put their, themselves out there and say, here's what I think and this is my decision. I, I can just speak for myself, you know, that it's, it, it's and, and, and speaking with other women, that it's scary to do that. And, um, and it seems possibly more challenging for women to do that. And so I'm not sure whether if you have that propensity already, just naturally, whether you can even answer the question. But, um, you know, it's something like how do you develop that? Because when, when I speak to, when I hear from women who are very afraid of what people think, and don't want to be perceived as a bitch or, you know, and just just feel like they're walking a very fine line when it comes to being a boss, being a leader, being a decision maker. Um, well, I, I do think you walk a fine line. I think that, that, that is true. But I, what I would 
what I would like to add to that is, did everybody hear the question? Um, I think that as women, and I don't want to get on my feminist pulpit here, but I think we underestimate ourselves enormously. Because, and I think, I think women are wonderful. And I see that, you know, knowing that you all agree with me. Um, <laughs> because if you really look at what a woman does in just a normal day, she does so much more than a man could even begin to cope with. You're making decisions all day long, whether it's... <laughs> I, I stick to my guns. Um, we make decisions all day long, and we're, we're unaware of it. It's so much a part of our DNA that we don't give ourselves anything like the credit. I mean, if I look at you know, my day, I have to decide, well, first of all, I've got to make sure I've got two dogs, and I feed them organic food. So it's not I don't just open a can. You know, I have to either make it or I've got to go out and find a special place. So I've got to make sure that that's there. I've got to make sure the housekeeper's paid and so on. All of those little things that we take for granted, that it's just sort of our job to do, we need to acknowledge ourselves for. Because you're going to find, if you do that, you make far more decisions than you think you do. Now, are you waffling when it comes to what you consider to be a big decision? I can't help you with that one. Uh, you know, I would only say just dive in and do it. What, what, what can go wrong? What, what could, what's the worst that could happen? I think it's that, you know, when you were little, did you ever stand on top of a di the diving board and look down and think, oh, I'm going to do it. Do it. Did you ever walk away and not do it? I never did. You know, if I stopped there for half an hour, I knew, at some point I was going to get the courage to go off. And what's the worst that could happen? Well, I could drown, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wouldn't. Assess the risk and go for it. But, but the, the, the point that I, want, that I really want you to you know, take to heart is you do so much. We are, the, we are the multitaskers of this world. And we do it with compassion. We do it in a nurturing way. Um, and I think this word you use, so afraid of being, being called a bitch, there isn't an equal word that you can apply to men. You know, we talk of them about being... Uh, go-getters about being um, aggressive, but there isn't a, there isn't an e a, a word. So why would we even say that, or even think that about ourselves? But so so then it's our job to set them straight, <laughs> and, and 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 do that, and then not care. It doesn't matter. Put your, have, be focused on the goal, what it is that you want to achieve. You know, when, when, when things get really rough, I pull out a few testimonials and I read what women have said about how we've changed their lives. And I think, so somebody in accounting doesn't like me today because I wanted a report that they didn't have ready. So is that, does that matter in the bigger picture of what we're accomplishing? No. They'll get over it. Well, they won't. And then they need to find another company they can feel better at. <laughs> Jenny. I have so many questions. I'm going to narrow it down to one, which is I was taken by your phrase that you uh, mentioned that you don't use the lists. You don't work on lists. I don't very often do lists. Christmas card lists, that sort of thing. You don't, you don't make lists. I don't make many lists, no. Well, how do you stay organized? <laughs> 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 I, I, um, how do I stay organized? I don't know. I have, I have a few little rules that I, that I stick by. If I'm going off on a trip, I, I leave my desk clean. I want to, I don't. I don't want to have piles of stuff. I don't know what they are, what's in them. Um, I don't like to leave emails hanging around too long. Um, 
I just have an organized mind. I, I, I do. Do I have an organized mind? Yeah, I do have an organized mind. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. I find I make lists, but then I never look at them. And you probably don't take on more than you can actually handle. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do. I'll think about that one. How I say it. I do have a I do have a notebook, but at the moment I've got four notebooks on my desk. And I have to get rid of some of them and just c consolidate it all in one notebook. And um, I, you know, I write I write that things down, and then as I'm as I'm I might go ten pages, and then I look back over those pages, and then I cro I tick off the things that I've done, I've accomplished, I've accomplished, and I move the things I haven't forward, so I, I don't miss things that way. It's not a list. It's as the day goes on, I write down. Oh, I've got to you know, do that, or I promise somebody I'd do that, or something like that. And I just follow my do what you say you're going to do rule, and it all works out. Um, now, that, thank you for coming and speaking with us. It's been really nice to hear you, Jane. But now that your company is growing, do you um, do you think that you may um, like have an IPO or go public with your stock or anything? Like that? <laughs> <laughs> not not while I'm not while I'm there. No. Yeah. You've talked about the different stages of your business mm -hmm. development, and there's a stage that comes when. <clears throat> You've taken on the responsibility to carry debt to expand your business. No, I, I didn't take on my responsibility to carry debt. No, we, we funded ourselves out of our cash flow. Well, in, in, in many instances, when we, there, was a, there was a time when we, uh, we bought back our distributorship, our U.S. distributorship, and that cost us a lot of money, and we did go into debt for that. Yeah. So I'm looking for some inspiration and guidance how to manage the responsibility of the debt while you're trying to grow a business and hold on to a vision. You have to pay your debt. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean you, you, can't, you can't take on debt unless you know you can, you, that you can pay for it. I mean, that would be irresponsible. So you, you, you simply can't take on debt and then be crushed with the stress of not being able to pay it off. Now, things happen where you, you I mean, and a bank isn't going to lend you money unless they feel you can pay, pay it. So, but some things happen, you know, maybe the economy tanks and, and you can't, and then that, that's awful. And then you've got to work out a new deal. You've got to work out something with them that, so that you can pay. And that's what I was talking about earlier about how, that, that transparency, that communication is so key because a bank would much rather you come and set up a meeting and say, look, this is what's happening. I need to reduce my debt and I need to reduce my payments and they will work. They will work something out with you because they don't want to reclaim your house or reclaim your car or whatever. They, they, you know, they were in it because they believed in you and they want to see you uh, make that work. Uh, thank you. And I'm also wondering how with the, you've spoken a lot, I, I guess what I'm noticing is that you speak a lot about never losing sight of your vision, what, whatever the challenges are that you face, whatever obstacles may come your way, whatever, whatever failures may cross your path as you move on uh, to be a successful businesswoman. So I, I guess uh, what I'm affirming is just that. And when I put myself in the position of my own vision and the idea of my own success, there are times when being a mother and managing a business and taking care of a household and all the multitasking that I do, it's a bit of a challenge to stay totally focused on the vision, to rise to the level with the confidence that brought me to the place to begin with. And I, you're so experienced at that. And, and 
Well, I don't, I, yeah, I, yes, it is a challenge. Um, I, I listened to a, uh, a speaker who'd written, written a, a book just recently that, um, and it's called um, Stick to the Why. And what he was saying was that most companies, if you think of it as the three circles, you think the inner circle is the why, and then there's the what, and then there's a the how. And most companies work from the how into the why. But successful companies, he used Apple as a very good example of this, work from the why out. Apple never loses sight of the why. And their why was, I'm not going to get the words right, but the, they, they were something like to revolutionize or what was it, they, they, to be the, the revolutionary in the industry. I forget what it was. But they've never lost sight of that. And I, and I think that, 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 that he's right. The, the why is the key. So you work from the why out and not from the how in. Jan, I think if I could just um, rephrase that question for a sec about the um, managing it all at the really early stages. So you were talking about how you went, you had the receivables of like twelve hundred dollars, and you your passions convinced the um, loan officer to give you a loan for ten thousand dollars to go to a trade show. You probably didn't have it lined up that you have ten thousand dollars, you know, in sales commitments, okay, from the trade show, but that was your intention. Um, so obviously there was this that like that leap of faith that he took with you to go to that trade show and be able to pay back that loan for Well it, it wasn't quite like that because I when you get loans you don't have to pay it all back at once. That's the good thing about loans. <laughs> you you could pay it up back a bit at a time. Oh, I you know I, I God, I, what was driving me in those days? I have no idea. But I do, I it was just inexplicable confidence. I I um I ju I knew that I would sell my product and. I was, going to, I was going to be able to pay off that loan. And I paid it off early. And I thank him to this day. Yeah. It seems to be, I mean, from what I'm hearing is going back to do you have a stomach for sacrifice and how much courage do you have to see that through to the next step? I have recently had a service business that due to the economy didn't make it and um, you know in that recovery of failure but I've been able to look back and see at all the things that did work mm -hmm. and how to bring those forward for the next ideas that I have mm -hmm. I'm not um, bereft of ideas I need the nuts and bolts which is why a lot of us are here you know um, I got very good at what I was doing, but I realized I didn't spend enough time getting the business end of it handled. And that's my agenda this year, is to get the nuts and bolts down so that whatever project I choose next, I have the building blocks to actually make it successful and to survive regardless of the economy and being able to move with that. And if I choose, as you do, to let go of something, it's out of choice, not because I have to. Yeah, the, the, you know, I hope this doesn't sound too um, harsh, but ideas are easy. Everybody has ideas. It's the following through on the ideas that's the hard part. And what and and coming here and understanding what those building blocks are. That doesn't mean that there's a set formula, because entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs. They're going to do it their way. But to have a, a, an idea about the, the fundamentals and the, how you prioritize and what you need to do to make sure that when you fall on hard times that you, there is help out there is really, is really important. And so I commend you for laying one of those foundation blocks by coming here. And Jane, let me just add, add to that. So on the resource sheet, is a list there of some extraordinary 
websites that will give you a list of so many organizations that want to support you in developing business opportunities, entrepreneurship, through Berkshire Creative, through small business organizations. So take a look at those because there's a lot of places that are ready to support exactly like what you're asking for. This will probably be one last question, I think. Yeah. Um, so thank you again. You know, it's really inspiring to see you. You're so poised, and you're so beautiful, and you're so comfortable in your success that it's really, it's really lovely and inspiring to see. And that's thank you. Thank you. Um, that, and that's really my question. Is I think um, I know for me in my life, I know a lot of women who success kind of comes easy for them, and their relationship with money is easy, and it comes and goes, and it's you know well filled, and it's all you know. And for some of us, it's, you know, there's a little more personal growth work that needs to happen before we can get to that other lovely place. So just out of curiosity, which camp did you fall in? And did you have to do any personal growth work to become this poised, beautiful, comfortable, and successful woman? Or is that who you always were? I think you'd have to ask my mom that. <laughs> She'd just say she's always been bossy. Um, uh, I did, I, you know, personal growth, I, I did take the S training. Um, I think, uh, I think life has, has been my personal growth. And, and I, I just recently had, did an interview when they asked me about um, whether I believed in mentors and did I, had I ever had a mentor. And I, 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 my answer was, I certainly believe in mentors for some people. I think mentors work for people. They didn't, I've never had a mentor. My, my mentors have been uh, people that don't even know me, but I, um, I pick up things from them. For example, I use this example of Meryl Streep, who, uh, when I was a casting director, she was you know, an up-and-comer, and, -comer and I, did, I actually did meet her once. I gave her a script, but I... She's the one person I'd like to count, say I ha she's a friend, but no, I can't. <laughs> um, she, I don't know how, how you, many of you know this, but she uh, was, lived with, in the village, a very uh, good young actor. The two of them together were amazing. And he died of leukemia, and she nursed him through that whole thing. You know, really gave up part of her career and so on. And when she was asked several years later about that, about how she did it, she said, I've always been my own tower of strength. And I've never forgotten that. And I thought that really, I think that, that I can apply that to myself. as something I'm going to live with. And I, and I, and I, I do feel that way when, when things are not going well. I... I um, give you a quick story. I, I lived in Copenhagen for a couple of years. I was in the British Embassy, and it was my first time away from home. I was really young, and, and um, I, you know, I, I didn't go away to school, so I, and I was very close to my, my mother, and, and, I, uh, and I was feeling very sad, for, sorry for myself. Um, the British Embassy is a bit stiff. You know, there weren't many people there giving you too many hugs. <laughs> um, especially since I was sort of so young, and anyway, I um, I was I, I was sitting up in bed one night, and I and opposite there was this uh, dresser with this big mirror, and I had my hair in rollers. You know those times we used to go to bed with these big rolls, and how we ever slept in them, I don't know. But <laughs> sitting there looking at myself, looking at this miserable face staring back at me, and all of a sudden I winked. I went to myself. <laughs> And it changed my whole attitude. And I think, even though I didn't have the phrase and I've always been my own tower of strength, I thought, I can do this. You can do this, kid. And it, you know, then I met this dashing Marine and we had this two years of lots of fun. Um, so anyway, I don't know if, if that... Uh, but I think those things that you, that, if, that you pick up that resonate with you through life, you need to hang on to them and pull them out when you need them. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you.